Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Yields drop, stocks pop, inflation data in America showing some signs of cooling. Equity futures of 7 tenths of 1%. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. No fireworks here. Inflation data in America calling once again, putting even more pressure on the US dollar as the Fed begins to lean towards a smaller move. Inflation. The CPI report. The December CPI report. There's a lot of hype for this number. We, like the rest of the market, have no choice but to, to follow what Powell is focused on. It's the beginning of the year. It's the last inflation print before the Fed meeting. The economic models will tell you that we need demand destruction to get inflation to come down. So really it's the, it's the labor market that almost matters more than today's, uh, today's inflation report. In other words, we need a much higher unemployment rate. The Fed is now focused on the sliver of CPI that is wage sensitive. Powell has been very focused on wages. Get rid of anything that's not attached to wages. But the problem is, maybe inflation today is not driven by demand. At this point, it's a lot more noisy. For more, let's get to Mike McKee. Mike McKee, your read on things 30 minutes after that report. Well, steady as she goes, the progress continues on inflation. There are a few hiccups here and there, but overall, it looks like the Fed can dial back its rate increases and start to think about when they might pause. The numbers come in bang on expectations, down a tenth of a percent on the headline, up three tenths on the core. Uh, food prices up but decelerating. Gasoline prices fell off a cliff during the month. Apparel prices were surprisingly up a little bit. Uh, but uh, we were just talking with Dana Telsey about that, and she said um, that's because men's clothes are selling better. Used cars down almost the same as the prior month. So some of the categories that had pushed inflation higher over the last year really starting to back off now. And that's true in the goods area. You can see goods prices are continuing to deflate down half a percent uh, from the eight tenths in November. Services prices, though, still going up. So that makes us look at the core services X housing number J Powell's number and that was up three tenths of a percent in December compared to one tenth of a percent taking out rent and owners equivalent rent and uh, that's a number that matters to the Fed because they know home prices are not rising anymore but it still shows up that way in the CPI so the question becomes what does the Fed do from here uh, they were slow to react to inflation going up now are they going to be slow to react to inflation coming down? Uh, that's an open question at this point, although we do have Pat Harker from the Philadelphia Fed this morning saying he's ready for 25 basis points instead of 50. And Susan Collins said the other day she is too. We'll see who else uh, joins that parade today. I think, John, uh, one of the key numbers, and I just got this in from Omer Sharif of Inflation Insights, is if you look at it on a three-month basis, the core CPI is 3.1%, and the six-month is 4.5%. So we're really seeing a decline in sequential inflation uh, that is uh, taking hold here. you got to get rid of those base effects, and you're really seeing some movement. And so the Fed's going to be thinking about this now. And, Mike, it's happening with unemployment at 3.5% still. Yeah, we could mention very quickly that uh, we only had 205,000 initial jobless claims distorted by the holidays, but certainly no indication that we're losing a lot of people. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Counting you down to that opening bell about 25 minutes away, 26 minutes away. Equity futures are higher by 7 tenths of 1%. Seen a rally come into the front end of the bond market of the yield curve, down 10 basis points on a two year, 4.12% now on a two-year, on a 10-year down seven basis points to 347. And we're seeing a ton of dollar weakness as well. Euro dollar reclaiming a 108 handle, 108.22 euro dollar positive by six tenths of 1%. With us now, I'm pleased to say, TD's Priya Misra, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Priya, first to you, your first take on this one. 
Sure. So I, I, you know, I think there were some positives in the form of this. Uh, you know, inflation has clearly peaked. I think we're we're seeing goods inflation continuing to decline. What I'm a little surprised by the market reaction is that the service inflation, you know, uh, so service CPIs, uh, shelter inflation, core services ex shelter, that's still high. Um, you know, it's actually accelerated over the last couple of months. I think if you take the Fed at face value, that's what they care about. I think the easy part of, of the decline in inflation may be underway. Goods inflation is declining, commodity prices are falling. The, the much harder part is getting that service inflation down consistent to 2%. I think the market thinks that, you know, they can extrapolate this trend and that the Fed has maybe one or two more 25 basis point hikes. I think the Fed may have to actually continue to hike. So our call is five and a half for, for that terminal rate. We're calling for a 50 in February. I mean, maybe that's a 25, but I think the Fed's going to say we're not done. I, I think the market's a little too optimistic, extrapolating that this decline in service inflation will continue. And historically, service inflation is very sticky on the way down. Jim Bianco, are you on the other side of that argument? Not really. I think that what the market is, should be focusing on as we go forward from here is where do we go next? Okay, inflation peaked, 9% was the high. That's the easy call. It's very obvious that that's happened. Are we going to 2% without any kind of intervention like a recession or anything else to dampen demand to get us down there? Or, as Mike McKee just pointed out, do we bottom out somewhere around 3 or 4%, the three- and six-month averages that we've seen? Is that where we bottom? Because if that's where we bottom, that will be unacceptable for the Fed, and that they will not be looking to pivot or they won't be looking to slow down the rate hikes. Yes, they'll move 25 basis points in February. That has been priced in for a month now, that it would be a 25 basis point move, and maybe 25 basis points after that. But I think the narrative and the attention should turn to how far down are we going to go not has inflation peaked this is what sarah house of wells fargo is getting at as well she says we're approaching this last mile this big effort and that last mile will be the hardest mile priya you've made the same point just how much demand destruction you still think we need to get inflation to where the fed wants to see it so I think we need a lot more demand destruction, particularly in the labor market. I think businesses are hoarding labor. You know, wages did come down a little bit last week, but you know, you still look at year over year wages well north of, of uh, four and a half percent, not consistent with 2% inflation. I would also argue the lags point, you know, the long and variable lags. The Fed is looking at data right now and that data on the labor market does not suggest that demand destruction. You know, how forward looking can the Fed be to say that we think this demand destruction will happen in the labor market six months out? I think if you take them at face value, they are saying they're responding to data as it comes in. So, you know, our view is is they are going to be late. And I think the market is cheering. We're pricing in more rate cuts at the end of this year, more cuts next year. I think that is a mistake because the Fed is telling us they're worried about the mistake of the 70s. They really want to see that 2% inflation. And my views are there, there are structural forces that's going to keep inflation high. Until the Fed accepts that and is perhaps okay with the 3% inflation, they are going to be really reluctant to, I would even argue, stop hiking let alone start to cut rates. So this optimism why the two years falling is all these cuts getting priced in. I think that can get taken out as we hear from the Fed that they can stop at, you know, maybe it's five, five and a quarter or five and a half. And then they're going to just stay there for a very long time while that demand destruction that you talk about is an intended consequence of policy and they have to see that through. And I think the market's already looking ahead to when can that easing happen. I think we'll have to we'll be waiting for quite some time for that. Priya, you mentioned what's happening right now. Neil Dutter of Renmark is pushing back against all these recession calls and talking about what he thinks is happening right now. Financial conditions are now easing and have been for a couple of months, supporting economic growth right now. Instead of long and variable, I think the lags are short and predictable. Jim Bianco, your thoughts on that? The fact that some people think we're actually seeing a reacceleration in the U.S. economy. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that initial claims this morning at 205,000 and there really isn't a lot of evidence that the economy is slowing. When Priya says, you know, we need to see more demand destruction in labor, I, I want to say we need to see any demand destruction in labor right now because 3.5% unemployment, 205,000 in initial claims, and still printing 200 plus thousand for uh, payrolls every month, that's not demand destruction at all. And if those numbers continue to move forward from here, it's going to be hard to bring that wage inflation down, which is at 4.5%, 
I think much below three and a half or three percent. And according to Powell's, uh, you know, services X housing, you're not going to see inflation, you know, dip into a two handle without that demand destruction. And if we don't get it, then we're going to have to pivot that narrative, as I was talking about earlier, to not just that inflation is peaked, but how do we get to 2 percent without a recession? And if we come out of a recession, does inflation just bounce right back up above 2 percent? And that's an uncomfortable question for Wall Street right now. Mike McKee mentioned Patrick Harker a few minutes ago, leaning towards a 25 basis point hike over at the Philly Fed. He says this, though, in response to some questions in the Q&A, favors rising rates a bit above 5 percent and then pausing. Now, to your point, Priya, if we take the Fed at face value, they're not cutting interest rates. But I think the problem at the moment, Priya, is that I can't find many people that are taking the Fed at face value. Can you? You know, I think that when you listen to the Fed, all they can sort of tell us is the reaction function. So maybe the markets understood their reaction function. I think where the debate in the market is the economic outlook. I think the market is a lot more optimistic than the Fed um, in terms of how quickly that inflation will decline. Look at the tips market. Market's pricing in one year inflation at 2%. I mean, we're talking about it, will it settle at 3 you know, as, as, as a good thing, but the market's pricing in well well below that. So I think um, the market pricing in these cuts is not so much second guessing the Fed reaction function. It's saying that the economy might be much weaker, that inflation might be much weaker. And so the Fed will have the ability to cut rates because inflation is back down. I think the uncomfortable question uh, to Jim's point is, you know, uh, is if what if inflation does settle at 3%? Then I think the Fed is telling us very clearly that they need a much higher rise in the unemployment rate, closer to, I would say, 5%, which we're very far from, before they can respond. So it's really this tension of what is the economic outlook? The Fed has one view, and I think the market is saying, oh, no, inflation's now headed down, just as we couldn't quite forecast how quickly it would rise. I think the market's saying, we've all gotten it wrong, inflation is going to decline much faster. And I think that might be the disconnect, why the market is so much below the Fed dots. Well, there's another dynamic we need to discuss as well. And Jim Bianco, that's China reopening. How much does that complicate the outlook? Oh, I think it complicates the outlook a lot, because while China is reopening, zero COVID is gone, the mobility numbers are showing, like the transit numbers, that people are getting out of their house and finally moving around. What does that mean? Wall Street wants to think that means, oh, 2019 is coming back. Everybody's going to return to the factory and we're going to make iPhones just like nothing happened in the last two years. Or does it mean in China, like it's meant in the West, that while we got out of the house and we started moving around, there were fundamental changes to the economy in the West, work from home, remote work being the biggest one that we're all familiar with. Does China experience some kind of a fundamental change so that just penciling in a return to 2019 growth rates and 2019 production rates because zero COVID has been lifted might be a little bit premature? Yeah, they're going to reopen, but we don't know what the composition of that's going to look like, and that does complicate things. Have you got a base case yet, Jim, or is it still too early? I think it's still, it's still too early, but if I had a base case, it would probably be that the production numbers that everybody's expecting, really what Wall Street is expecting is raw material prices are going to rise because China, the factory of the world, is going to suck everything in, whether it's industrial metals to energy, push up those prices. Out the backside is going to be a bunch of finished goods, which is going to help to further depress core inflation. That's been the narrative for the last few months. I think that probably the first half is going to uh, unfold but the second half, as far as the massive amount of finished goods, because if, the, if, if China's listening to everybody else, where the world's going into a recession, they're not going to be ready to really crank up production as hard as we think or hope that they are, that that might disappoint a little bit as we move forward. Great. Just a final word on China, please. So one of the things I'm watching is on the stimulus front. I mean, you know, um, if China's opened up, how much are policymakers there going to put in terms of fiscal stimulus, credit easing? Remember 2015, massive amounts of credit easing then was a global growth positive. I, you know, our view is it's going to be more targeted. It's going to be more domestic leaning as opposed to a global growth surge. But I'm certainly watching that those credit numbers. And if that starts to ramp up, I think it takes a big tail risk for the economy out. And that can explain why, you know, we're talking about a, a recession and yet financial conditions are easing. Well, because China is going to be this growth engine 
due to easing. I, I, I think it's it's still early. We're, we're watching both fiscal as well as credit easing measures in China to see what the global growth outlook, what China growth outlook will be beyond just what's happening in the US, which I think a slowdown is is at this point in our view. We have, we have a recession baked in for the second half of this year. Prime Minister. Jim Bianco sticking with us. Equity futures right now fading just a little bit, still positive by two tenths of one percent into the bond market where we have got this rally at the front end of the curve, rally right the way through the curve, but particularly on the two year. We're down about seven basis points on the two year to about 415 in the FX market. Some dollar weakness for you. Euro dollar just in and around 108. Coming up, another cooler inflation print for DC. We got an inflation report exactly as 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 we expected. We also got a reminder that the labor market is running pretty hot. The View from Washington, up next. Yes, we got an inflation report exactly as, as as we expected. We also got a reminder that the labor market is running pretty hot. Aggregate demand has momentum. That's putting pressure on resources. That will put pressure on wages and therefore on prices. Maybe not this month on prices or wages, but the mechanics are there. The mechanism that you worry about inertial inflation is there. A little bit of good news for the Biden administration as the nation sees three straight months of calling inflation. The president preparing to deliver remarks at the top of the hour. This coming as the controversy over classified documents continues to unfold in Washington. Bloomberg's Anne Marie joins us now from the White House. Morning, AMH. Good morning, John. That's right. The president is likely going to seize on these numbers, especially the month on month decline. And so much of that was driven by the drop of gasoline prices. When just a few months ago, this was the biggest, biggest political headache facing this administration, especially heading into those midterm elections. And now they can really breathe a sigh of relief of where gasoline prices are going. But we should know he cannot claim victory too quickly. One on gasoline prices, because whether it's Pierre Onderon or Will Kennedy in the last hour with you and Tom talking about oil prices, they are expected to go up. So potentially um, it's too quick to really claim that victory on where gasoline prices are going in the future. And there's also other factors in this CPI report, like shelter, like recreation, like clothing that is going up. But overall, this is a good sign for this administration. Can you tell me what the plan is to refill the SPR? Anne-Marie, and how much the China reopening complicates that effort? Well, now that you see prices much higher, Jonathan, it's going to be incredibly difficult for the administration to refill the SPR. They want it really below $70 a barrel, and we are already above that. And when you have Pierre Andoram, when you have Jeff Curry talking about prices north of $100, that is not going to mean a refill of the SPR anytime soon. And China obviously is the biggest question mark on this in terms of how higher gas, uh, oil prices will go and then thus gasoline prices. Because if we have a quick and clean reopening of China and they start consuming a lot more, and you can see the trend of just automobiles on the streets in Beijing and Shanghai start ticking up higher, then that's going to mean higher oil prices and less of a, of a fact that the U.S. is likely going to want to refill that SPR anytime soon. AMH, thank you. Down at the White House, we'll hear from the President of the United States in about 40 minutes' time, scheduled to speak at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Premier Minister Jim Bianco back with us. Jim, I want to talk to you about the fact that we came into this year waiting for this growth slowdown, and all of a sudden people are starting to pile in to long EM equities, long European banks over the last six months, the copper trade starting to deliver in a massive way. 9K, Goldman talking up 11.5 maybe at some point this year. Looking at high yield spreads on the screen right now. The wides of last summer were 583, we're at 420. Credit spreads are rallying. Jim Bianco, make sense of that as we discuss the possibility. Priya's talking about the potential of a recession in the second half. Well, let's start with the most powerful drug on Wall Street, and that's mean reversion. That when you show a bunch of professional managers markets that are down a lot, <clears throat> their instinct is to bet that they are going to rebound to revert to some kind of a mean. So a lot of what you're seeing, as you mentioned, just to pick one European banks, European bank stock index is at the same level it was in 1987. There has been no movement in European banks for 35 years. So the 40 percent rally that we've seen in them since July is more, I think, in the mean reversion camp. So there's a lot of that going on in the market, too. 
Second of all, the narrative on Wall Street has always been a weak first half, strong second half. So to take a word from the recent past, everybody thinks that the weakness is going to be transitory yeah. and that it, it will give way to a second half strength. So look past whatever weakness we see, look past whatever potential recession talk that we've seen, because don't worry, by the third or fourth quarter, we'll be past that. And stocks and supposedly risk markets, as you mentioned, are supposed to be more forward looking than that. The consensus is starting to crack pretty quickly. It's only January 12th. We'll see how this shapes up in about a week from now. Priya, just a final word from you on this. This headline across the Bloomberg a few hours ago that you've responded to already, but I'd love your input on. Three month LIBOR, dollar LIBOR exceeding the 2008 financial crisis high. Priya, I guess my first question to you is just how relevant is that anymore? It's not relevant. I mean, there are very few new contracts actually do not take LIBOR. The existing contracts, LIBOR is going away in, in, in now less than six months. They're all going to move to SOFR. So I would say it doesn't matter. What it does show is bank funding costs are going up. I mean, the banks are having to pay more for to keep deposits. They've been losing a lot of deposits as, as Fed fund rates have been rising. You know, are, they raise, are banks raising money in the wholesale market? I think the general trend, why it moved today, I think is not obvious. But, you know, there's a problem process how that LIBOR is computed. It's still a floating rate index. It's going to go away. So I think it doesn't matter. But it does reflect that bank funding costs are going up. NIMS are under pressure. If the Fed keeps hiking, I think you'll continue to see these funding costs for banks continue to rise. I think that's what it's reflecting. But it shouldn't be a, a worry for anyone. Because it, that earnings. index itself is going away. Tomorrow morning, JP Morgan, B of A will be focused on that. Priya, thank you. Priya Misra there. And Jim Bianco, pretty with some big calls, looking for 550 on Fed funds later this year and potentially a recession as well. Inflation data in America bang in line with estimates. Equity futures positive by just a tenth of 1% on the S&P. The Nasdaq now slightly negative. That rally in the bond market faded a little bit, still lower at the front end. Yields down by six basis points on a two-year to 415. If you look at the FX market, that dollar weakness has started to come through recently. Euro dollar had a look at 108. Dollar yen had a look at 129. Euro dollar right now, 107.98. More on that in just a moment. Coming up in the morning calls and later, big banks kicking off earnings season tomorrow. Jonathan Gollop, the Credit Suisse, expecting a 3 to 5% contraction in earnings this year. That conversation coming up shortly. Four seconds away from the opening bell this morning. Good morning. This Thursday morning, CPI data has come out bang in line with expectations. Equity futures off the back of it, just about positive by two tenths of one percent. Putting together two days of gains coming into Thursday. Can we make it three on the S&P? Let's your opening bell. Switch to the board and get to the bond market. Yield shaken up as follows on a 10-year yield in America, down three or four basis points, sub 350. A little bit early this morning, 350.41 right now. The high of last year, the 10-year peaked at 4.33 back in October. We're well below that level now by more than 80 basis points. In the FX market, euro dollar, hello, 108, 108.19, 108.20 on euro dollar, up six tenths of 1%. This dollar weakness that's kicking in is real. I'm going to pick up on that story in just a moment. Crude right now approaching 79 on WTI, up by two percentage points on the session. That's the cross-asset price action. About 30 seconds into this one, we advance about a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up a third of 1% also. One stock to watch at the open, it's Disney. The company facing a proxy war with activist investor Nelson Peltz. For more on that, here's Abby. Hey, John. Well, yeah, it looks like it's going to be a battle. And with the stock higher right now, up more than 2%, it suggests some shareholders and at least one analyst on Wall Street agree with Nelson Peltz's view. Now, they, of course, did this morning, Trion Management, uh, file a preliminary proxy statement uh, urging shareholders, other shareholders, uh, to support his nomination to the board. Some of those other shareholders, Vanguard, BlackRock, State Farm, uh, Newport, Royal Bank. Now, currently, uh, Trion Management has a roughly 900 million stake. That would put them right around 22 or 23. So a pretty big uh, shareholder there. And they are criticizing a number of factors right now 
first and foremost, they really want a Bob Iger succession plan put in place. They're also talking about uh, excessive compensation and the fact that the company has perhaps overpaid for some assets, including some of those 20th century Fox media uh, uh, assets. Now, relative to paying for them, the debt is high. This could be another I issue. Uh, right now, Disney's long-term debt, about $49 billion. Uh, so relative to the stock, though, this is another issue brought up in that preliminary proxy statement. Since its peak, it is down, and this was, came as a surprise to me, it's down 50%. I mean, it's really pretty incredible decline at this point, so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, and Nelson Peltz is known for having won some of these proxy wars in the past. They're not for the faint of heart, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not he convinces other shareholders to allow him to be nominated to the board. Brutal 12 months. Abby, thank you. I started the show by saying no fireworks. You want some fireworks? You want some price action? Bed Bath & Beyond. Monster. Monster move. Have a look at this. Up by 15%, and have a look over the last three days as well. Katie Lyons, explain this, please. I wish I had a good explanation for why fundamentally this was happening, John, but it has indeed been remarkable. This 15%, actually now 17% gain today, would be the smallest we've seen in four days, a four-day period in which we have seen the stock rally 200%. It was up 69% yesterday alone, a record day of gains, and really for no good reason, considering last week this company warned it was maybe going to have to file for bankruptcy. Then we actually got results from it this week that showed a wider loss than expected. The company attributing part of that to its inventory structure struggles because suppliers have lost trust in the company's ability to make payments. Sales growth also has been floundering. So do fundamentals really support this rally whatsoever, John? The answer is no. Maybe we can attribute some of it to a short squeeze, given that short interest in the stock has been rising and is now about 52% of float. But mostly it just seems like meme trader behavior is making a comeback because this has extended beyond Bed Bath & Beyond. We've also seen gains in the likes of AMC and GameStop, even Carvana rising as well. So meme stops as a group actually have had a pretty solid start to 2023, up about 10% so far. That only goes so far, though, to undo the damage that was done to these names last year. That meme ETF down more than 60% in the last 12 months, John. Bed Bath & Beyond up about 20% right now. Katie, thank you. Three or four minutes in then, about unchanged on the S&P, almost negative now on the Nasdaq by about a tenth of 1%. Some good news for the airlines. After a rough couple of weeks, American Airlines beating estimates in its prelim results on robust holiday travel demand. Ed Ludlow, these numbers are pretty impressive. Yeah, they are impressive. You take the group as a whole, that group of US-listed airlines, they're on track for their seventh straight day of gains, which would be the longest winning streak going back to August of 2020. I like some good news at this time in the week, Jonathan. What's interesting is what the story is here. The EPS range for the fourth quarter, $1.12 to $1.17, almost double what the street was forecasting. Again, these are prelim results from American Airlines. But what they're talking about here and the story is, A, there was demand over the holiday period, which is interesting because we're kind of trying to get a sense of how the consumer is doing right now. But there is some specifics within that, which is these are not big corporate accounts and business travel that is boosting American. It's actually SMEs, small and medium sized businesses, along with that le uh, leisure travel that's boosting the airline. But again, a strong outlook or a strong prelim call for the fourth quarter. Not so much sense though of what's happening to start this year. Abby mentioned the airlines to start the year. The airline stocks are doing great. Right. Ed, thank you, buddy. As always, you will hear from the president of the United States. Scheduled to speak in about 25 minutes' time. We've had a tweet from the President of the United States just moments ago. The President saying the following. For the six month in a row, yearly inflation is down. It might be rising in economies around the world, but it's coming down here in gas prices, food and more are following. Of course, there's a political lean here. That adds up to a break for families and proof that my plan is working. You'll hear from more from the president in about 25 minutes, as I say. A third straight month of calling inflation, then, is what we're focused on here. Jonathan Golliber, Credit Suisse, turning his focus on what it means for earnings. Inflation coming down means companies lose pricing power. Even though we don't expect a recession this year, we do expect earnings down 3 to 5% in 23 compared to 22. Jonathan Golub joins us right now. So, John, I'll give you the opportunity just to reflect first of all on what we heard in the inflation report about 50 minutes ago, an hour ago, and five minutes. Your thoughts, sir? Well, first of all, this was good news that inflation is coming down, but you have to really look under the hood and ask why is it coming down. And what we saw was that goods prices are basically free falling. Um, we saw in, um, I think it was February or March, goods price inflation was up 12.3%, uh, and now it's down, I think, 2.1% in this report. And that's because of, 
you know, we're further away from the heart of the pandemic and supply chains are opening and, you know, autos are now more available and that's very good news. However, service prices have remained sticky. And if you take out the, you know, the rents, which are considered part of services, if you look at, you know, the plain old vanilla services, um, it's basically flatlining at a reasonably high level. So there's, there's a little bit of noise, but bottom line, this is uh, really good news overall in terms of the strength of the consumer. So John, I think B of A are looking at the same thing you're looking at. The equity strategy team expects margin compression in 23 amid demand uncertainty and a tougher pricing environment. But they said this, and I know you've thought about this, and that's why I want to ask you. They said still inflation wasn't a universal EPS positive. Where can you find that margin improvement in 23, John? You know, we have earnings coming down this year from, um, you know, something like 221, 223, something in that range to uh, 215 without a recession. So we're not doomsday or on, on doomsdayers on the economy, but we think that margins are going to be under pressure. Uh, margins are relatively high broadly. But here, if I kind of look at this employment report and see where's the real big issue, is that wage growth right now is advancing faster than overall inflation, which means companies, the wage growth is going to be their expense and the inflation, which is their pricing power, is coming down. And if companies have to pay out more to employees and have less ability to pass that on, last year was the opposite. Everyone thought the companies were going to get squeezed by higher inflation, and that was the opposite. They got huge pricing power. Um, this year, it's going to be a little bit more challenging, which is why, even though we don't think we have a recession, uh, we think profits are, are going to be incrementally lower. Uh, John, earnings season starts tomorrow morning. B of A, JP Morgan next week, Morgan Stanley, and we'll hear also from Goldman Sachs as well. Can we just talk more broadly about what you're expecting in earnings season and just where it compares to, say, expectations at the moment? Is the bar low enough for you, and where is the bar lowest? Well, so there's, there's a couple things that are, are gonna, we're going to see this earnings season. Um, expectations are that earnings will fall 2% relative to the fourth quarter of last year. But if you look at the median company or the typical company, it's actually expecting to see a 3.5% increase. So what, what that really means is that the really big companies are having a harder time on earnings and if you're a portfolio manager and you have a whole bunch of stocks in your portfolio, the majority of them are going to beat to the upside um, overall. So that's going to be one big theme. A second big theme is that tech companies have been a source of down, uh, downward revisions, uh, meaning that the earnings estimates for tech companies have been falling a ton. And in the last quarter, not only did they fall a ton, but then they missed the lowered estimates and we actually think that that's going to continue, that tech is in kind of a, a, a sour patch, if you will, for, uh, for several quarters. Now, on the other side, even though energy, um, the, the price of oil is down, you know, over the last three months or so, and gasoline prices is down over the last three months or so, the energy stocks, their earnings, um, their expectations are ripping. And we think that they'll actually surprise on uh, better numbers. So um, there, there's, you know, there's a number of, of different themes. The headline will be worse, but at a company level, things will be okay. So John, let's just build on that. If tech can't regain leadership and last year's winners, energy can maintain momentum, that's going to leave the index pretty challenged, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think Jonathan, there is, yeah. So first of all, well, we see the index from an earnings perspective, we think the numbers are going to be down, but we, um, what we found, we just did some research on this, that um, that the majority of the years that when earnings are up, the multiple contracts, or when earnings are down, the multiple goes up, as odd as that actually sounds. Last year, the earnings weren't great, but they were okay. And the market was terrible because the earnings came down. I'm saying the multiples, the PEs. So why did the PEs come down? Is because last year, the cost of capital, your 10-year your bond yield, um, started the year at 1.5 and ended the year at 3.9, did this huge increase in interest rates, and it knocked down the valuations of companies. This year, we think the opposite is going to happen. We've already seen um, interest rates fall. Um, we're seeing that, you know, even even today and yesterday, and that's part of the reason that stocks are off to a good start. It's not because earnings are good; 
is because interest rates have rolled down a little bit. People tend to not focus on that. And with that, John, the dollar's weaker, a whole lot weaker from its peak back at the end of September. Is that going to be a factor this earnings season? It's pretty well understood. We can all see it on the chart. Where's it going to show up? You know, it, it's never as big as, as we make it out to, to, to be. Um, roughly speaking, a 10% move in the dollar is about a 1% move in earnings. So the dollar, as, as U.S. inflation has been falling, the expectation is the Fed has to do a little bit less, and the dollar weakens on that. That's incrementally good for corporate profits, but you know maybe that gives you 20 or 30, 40 basis points of earnings. It doesn't really change the overall earnings season, but it does make U.S. companies a little bit more productive. And, and you may hear some of that in the language from companies, but it's, it really doesn't change the picture that much, John. Hey, John, it's good to catch up. Jonathan Golub there weighing in over at Credit Suisse. Appreciate it, John. As always, buddy, your broader equity market down about a third of 1%, 12 minutes into the session. We move on pretty quickly from CPI. The next stop for this market, of course, is JP Morgan tomorrow, Bank of America earnings. Then on to next week, we'll hear from the likes of Morgan Stanley and Goldman. Then on to the week after that. The week after that, we start to focus on tech, Tesla, Apple. If you want to call Tesla a tech company, I don't know if you do, but Apple in early February is going to be a massive focus given the weakness we saw at the back end of 22. In the bond market, a rally on a two-year. Yields lower by five basis points. Right now, 4.1655. Ten-year, basically unchanged at 3.5354. I mentioned that weakness we're starting to see in the US dollar. You can see it right the way through G10, particularly on the Japanese yen. Dollar yen has had a 1.5% move today off the back of a local report in Japan suggesting there might be a policy review of the BOJ as soon as next week. And now there are all these calls, particularly from City. Tom was talking about that a little bit earlier this morning, that maybe yield curve control gets dropped completely. The Japanese 10-year new threshold, 50 basis points. This market is pushing right up against it. Keep an eye on that one. Coming up on this program, positive signs emerging in the semiconductor place. It seems that there is a consensus at the moment that uh, the uh, uh, the recession is going to, going to be a mild one. Then the impact on the semiconductor sector uh, probably is going to be a, a mild one uh, as well. We'll talk chips up next. at the moment that uh, the, uh, uh, the recession is going to, going to be a mild one, then the impact on the semiconductor sector uh, probably is going to be a, a mild one uh, as well. Chip makers like, uh, like TSMC or Samsung are not really adjusting uh, strongly their, um, their, their, their capex. This is a war uh, between the leading edge uh, chip manufacturer. They have to uh, be uh, in, in, in front of the race, so, so they keep on spending. Auto earnings offering a mixed outlook for the industry. Taiwan Semi planning to cut spending, but the CEO striking a more optimistic tone, seeing an end to the chip crunch. It's a similar story for VW. The automaker expecting supply bottlenecks to ease despite sales plunging to an 11-year low. Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow here in New York alongside Craig Trudeau in London. Ed, what are we learning on the chip front? Yeah, it's, it's a mixed picture, isn't it, on TSMC? They are cutting CapEx for a range of $32 billion to $36 billion, down from $36.3 billion in 2022. They're talking about a decrease in sales in the first half of the year and slight growth in the second half of the year, netting out at slight growth overall, less than single digits for the full year. Sales are going to be between $16.7 billion and $17.5 billion for the fiscal first quarter, below analysts' consensus of $17.9 billion. So I don't, it's not clear whether the market, you look at the US listed shares of TSMC, the ADRs were up 5%, other chip makers lower, I guess given the outlook broadly for consumer electronics demand, are they cheering that cutting capex? It's only very slight. On the other hand, as you say, when we look at the auto sector, and these are pretty basic semiconductors, things that are processors translating the push of a button to an electronic signal, actually we see more availability of supply and growth in that market in 2023, which of course is a boost for some of the automakers who left vehicles on the concrete, right, waiting for those chips to come through before they can be sold. Craig, do you think these automakers will get some relief sometime soon? 
Yeah, I think you look at what happened with Volkswagen sales last year, an 11 year low for them, a 7% decline to just over 8 million. This is a company that for years in the lead up to the pandemic was doing 10 million plus units uh, a year. And we know that this is a supply issue from just looking at the order book. They talked about 1.8 million vehicles uh, just here in, in Western Europe that, uh, that, that are ordered and are awaiting delivery. So we know that, uh, of course, this is a company that has had some, some issues with, uh, you know, product appeal in, in China, has had some issues with software that, you know, potentially are costing it some customers. But this is absolutely the case uh, that they also have some demand that they've been unable to meet because of the semiconductor issue continuing to give them problems. The other big question as well for companies like Tesla is how much capacity do they need? Bloomberg learning that an expansion of Tesla's plant in Shanghai has been delayed over data concerns. Ed, can you run me through that one? Yeah, I, I, again, I think that uh, <laughs> data concerns, this is an interesting one reporting from sources over in Asia. I think the risk here is that uh, you pump out vehicles at high volume that then don't get delivered, right? We know that in China, while there's been supportive uh, policy and pullback on the COVID zero, the consumer is under pressure, but also there's a risk of the spread of the virus, which has impacted overall EV sales in that market in the months of November and December. There's a column out this morning from our colleagues at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which says basically overall, globally, we'll see a slowdown in the demand we saw in 2022 for electric vehicles. Whether Tesla actually has a demand problem, we don't know. All we have to go on is the reporting. They've used the lever of price cuts, which is indicative that they are worried about the need to at least uh, catalyze some new demand going forward, particularly in China. Craig, let's finish there. China reopening. Is this the game changer or not? Can we just put a bow on that? Yeah, I think there's absolutely the case that some car makers have, have uh, you know, pointed to this idea that they've just not been able to get, uh, you know, people in the showrooms. They've not been able to get uh, staff into those showrooms or into offices. So will we see uh, an uptick in, in some activity? Absolutely. I think the question to Ed's point is whether or not some of the issues that, you know, predate the, the most recent sort of round of lockdowns uh, still uh, have an effect on, on that market when you talk about the prop property bubble. Uh, and, and the sort of air coming out of that that Musk pointed to quite a bit toward the end of last year, whether or not that continues to be you know, something that, that plagues the industry going into 23. Hey, Craig, thank you. Craig Trudor over in London. Ed Ludlow here in New York. Thank you, gents. Appreciate it. Tesla getting hammered this morning again. The broader equity market totally rolling over here. We're down six tenths of one percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down one four percentage point. Abby has the breakdown at the sector level. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, not surprisingly, we have most sectors lower with this decline. It sort of feels like it's out of nowhere, but it is somewhat substantial, down six tenths of one percent. Now, the worst sector, healthcare, down one point two percent. We then have discretionary tech and communication services. So not surprisingly, those are your heavyweight tech sectors, the big weights to the S&P 500, and therefore you have the the index lower energy uh, is up 1% as oil is also up 1.2%. But you know where I want to go? I was going to take a look at those uh, techs rolling over, but they're not huge, huge declines. The bigger declines are smaller names. Take a look at these moves on the year. Now, does this look like a recession to you, John? We have the airlines, as we've been talking about, up 18% on the year. Metals and mining, an expectation of the global economy, up more than 15%. And then entertainment and uh, leisure products, all sharply higher. It does not look like so far investment are planning for a recession. Let's see what happens. Hey, there's there. some big moves, aren't there? It's early days, but they're big moves. It's only January 12th. I keep saying that. We're already questioning the consensus view. You can hear the cracks in it. About 23 minutes into the session, we're down seven tenths on the S&P. The Nasdaq now down by more than one percent. Coming up, your trading diary. Guessing the data is one thing, anticipating how the market's going to react to it is quite another. In line on inflation, right across the board, slap bang on estimates. Your equity market's lower by three quarters to one percent on the S&P and the Nasdaq. We're down by 1.3 percent. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. President Biden delivers remarks on inflation at the top of the hour. Plus, we hear from Fed presidents Bullard and Barkin. More Fed speak from Williams, Kashgari, and Harker coming up tomorrow, and it's the big banks tomorrow morning too. JP Morgan, Bank of America City, Wells Fargo kicking off earnings season. And finally, to get you to the weekend, we'll get you some new Mitch Consumer Sentiment Survey. 
results to round out the week. From New York City, that is it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the Open. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This is Bloomberg.